Hello, my name is Pastor Elizabeth Freeman. I'm the pastor at Lord of Light Lutheran Church and the Lutheran Campus Ministry at the University of Michigan. Um, the text I have for you today um, on this second Sunday of Easter is the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked out of fear of the people, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told them, told him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his, his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. So people are getting restless, especially here in Michigan. We've been locked away in our houses now, sheltering in place to protect ourselves and our neighbors for four weeks. Unlike the disciples who had locked themselves away for fear that they would meet the same fate as Jesus, we are sheltering in place out of love to protect our neighbors, to follow the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God, and love your neighbor as yourself. But at the same time as we approach what will be the peak in new cases and deaths before that curve really starts to bend, I'm increasingly hearing an undercurrent of fear. What if this isn't enough? What if all these sacrifices are for nothing? What if none of this does any good what if we're stuck living like this forever? As I watch the news in my home state and also nationally, I see agitation for lifting these protective measures early and the false choice between the economy and the lives of our beloved friends and family. I see people confusing the temporary with the permanent, failing to trust that there will be a future beyond what we are currently experiencing that what we are doing right now will make that future better. For the disciples, the world had changed so rapidly. Not even one week passed between Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, that fist shaking at the power of Rome and his honorless death as a criminal flanked by thieves. They had all seen it happen with their own eyes. To say they were surprised then when Jesus the dead man entered their secure room even though their door was locked would be a massive understatement. Jesus entered this room full of his terrified friends and rather than scolding them for cowering and hiding, he breathed a word of peace to them. He showed them that their fear was not going to have the last word. He showed them that he could be with them even when they were feeling alone and afraid, even when protecting themselves meant separating themselves from their society. 
Now, the disciples had witnessed Jesus heal lots of people, and they'd witnessed him raise Lazarus from the dead. So when he didn't save himself from his death on the cross, they must have figured this was it. This was the limit of his power. Even God wasn't more powerful than Rome. And we need to take a moment to recognize that Jesus didn't just leap down from the cross right away and say, it's all good. Jesus stayed dead for three days. He took his time before he was ready to come back. He took time to process the pain that had been inflicted on him. He didn't re-enter his community right away. He didn't feel the need to slap a smile on his face and make everyone else feel at ease. He didn't tell them to pretend that nothing had happened. When he entered that locked room, Jesus didn't hide his pain from them. Jesus showed them the truth. He showed them his hands and his side. And Jesus showed them that even with his wounds, even though they had tried to break him, he was still standing. And the disciples looked at his wounds and they believed him. They didn't discount his pain. They didn't say, well, you're still standing. It mustn't have been that bad. The disciples bore witness to Jesus' scars and rejoiced that their friend and teacher was back in their midst. That the incredible story they had been told by Mary Magdalene, Peter, and the other unnamed disciple was true. They rejoiced that here was evidence that even powerful Rome could not put their God to death. But all too often we are asked to bear witness to the scars of others and we turn away or discount them. Because bearing witness is uncomfortable, we look for ways to minimize the trauma, to deny that it happened, or to blame the victim. When a victim shows you their scars, they are trusting that you will believe them. And all too often, our instinct lies either in self-preservation or in avoiding conflict. We refuse to believe because fear holds us back. Fear that our own lives are also at risk. Fear that we will also be crushed by systems meant to keep us down. Fear that we will have to confront someone with more power. Fear of destroying relationships. But when Jesus showed his scars, when Jesus reached out in trust so that his disciples could bear witness to the wounds that had been inflicted on his body, they believed. We are told, most often, to keep our pain to ourselves. That pain is a private, personal matter. But Jesus actually shows us that our scars need to be shown. We're shaped by our experiences. We are who we are because of the lives we've lived and the wounds we bear are part of who we are. So it's really no surprise that a whole week later, Thomas demands to see what everyone else has seen. Jesus doesn't admonish him for his need and his desire. Jesus doesn't hide his scars from Thomas. Instead, Jesus says, look, here are the wounds on my hands. Here is the wound in my side. And because Jesus shows him, Thomas too can see that although Jesus is wounded, although he bears these scars, he is still standing. Jesus is not broken. The Roman Empire wanted to destroy Jesus, wanting, wanted to make his message irrelevant. But even though they killed him, they could not silence him. And Thomas responds with those words, my Lord and my God. Just after showing his scars, Jesus says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. While the first peace that Jesus speaks to his disciples is a comfort, this time is it, a, it is a challenge. Are we willing to sacrifice our comfort for the sake of our neighbors? Are we willing to trust that we are being called to do big things, that each of our little actions has a collective impact that is much greater than we can ever imagine. Jesus is calling us to follow him. 
Jesus is speaking to us when he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Jesus never promised that by following him, our lives would be totally comfortable and free of any conflict. The life of a Christ follower involves a call to a life that acknowledges and confronts our own scars and the scars of others. A life that doesn't keep such things hidden. And that's difficult. But Jesus does promise to walk with us, scars and all, strengthening us along the way. Throughout the Gospel of John, there are Greek words used, there are three Greek words used for life. Bios, psyche, and zoe. And so we can miss the meaning in the English translation because we've only got that one word, life. Bios and psyche are words that are used to describe what you have if you are a living being, your existence in the years between your birth and your death. But zoe, literally, life of the age, is something more. It's eternal life, a life lived in the abundance of God. And the Greek word that John uses at the end of this passage is zoe. These are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life, Zoe, in his name. This phrase is in direct contrast to the behavior of the disciples in both of Jesus' encounters with them in his, this passage. They've locked the doors, not to protect others, but because they are afraid. And Jesus comes to them anyway. Jesus comes through the locked door. They don't have to invite him in. He comes even though the violent death of their friend and teacher caused them to lose trust in the God who is still walking with them, even in their fear. Jesus comes to the disciples wounded and scarred, reiterating their call to mission in the world, reminding them of the world's need for their compassion and care, reminding them that when they bear witness to his scars, they are strengthened into new life, a strength, a life, Zoe, that comes from God. Because when Jesus calls us to life in him, he is not calling us to simply exist in a vacuum, thinking only of our own immediate wants and needs. Jesus is calling us to a transformational life, a life lived joyfully, reaching out, living into our community just as God intended, considering the impact each of our lives have on the lives of our neighbors. And we can't do that without bearing witness to the scars, our own and those of our neighbors. A transformational life is one that refuses to be defined by fear, even when so often our instinct is to close in on ourselves and live into that fear. Because we cannot live a full life, Zoe, while in fear, Jesus comes to us, wherever we are, and calls us out of the shadow of fearfulness to live a life informed by the scars that we have witnessed, our own scars and those of others. Jesus comes to us even when we are fearful, even when we are having trouble imagining what the future might hold calling us to live a life transformed by grace and peace and love. Even when the whole world is in fear, Jesus comes to us and gives us peace. Let us pray. God of peace, we thank you for coming to us even when we don't have the strength to ask you to be here. We thank you for walking with us even when we don't know you're with us. Comfort all those who are dying. Strengthen those who are healing. Bless the hands of all those who are working to heal others. And protect all our essential workers who are making sure we have food and electricity and water. Help us to always be mindful of the impact our actions have on our neighbors. And help us to always respond in love. In your holy name we pray. Amen.